a welcome to the first public lecture from the UCLA Meteorite Gallery of 2021. Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you're all doing all right. Um, today, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sarah Russell, who is Professor of Planetary Sciences at the Natural History Museum, London, where we've just established it's 1030 in the evening. So you want thank you, Sarah, for staying up late for us. <laughs> No worries. I should be in a little, yeah, go up, click that arrow. Okay. Um, so uh, Sarah, just by way of a little background, she earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Cambridge. And then she went on to the Open University for her PhD, for which she won the Royal Astronomical Society Keith Runcorn Prize for the Brett Best British doctoral thesis in geophysics in 1993, so quite a coup. Uh, Sarah then took her talents to the new world with postdoctoral <laughs> stints at Caltech and then at the Smithsonian before returning to the United Kingdom at the Natural History Museum where she heads the Planetary Materials Group. Sarah has been on three expeditions to Antarctica to search for meteorites. Um, and has thus won the Antarctic Service Medal from the United States Congress. She is the namesake of asteroid 5497. I didn't look up anything about that particular one, Sarah, but uh, <laughs> hopefully it's not an earth crosser. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's a fellow of the Meteoritical Society and the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, today, she's gonna tell us about clocks in rocks, how to date a solar system. So. Thank you, thank you for coming here virtually, Sarah, and, and welcome, everyone. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's a really kind introduction. And I'd like to start off by saying, um, I'm really excited to kind of be in California virtually, um, partly because it's freezing cold and wet in London and lovely in California always, uh, but also because, um, you know, California, Southern California is very important to me. It was a very important part of my career and um, uh, so I, sp I spent some time at Caltech and I uh, uh, did several collaborations with Kevin and, and with Ed Young and so it's really nice to be able to see all of my Californian friends again even if it is only across a computer screen. So I'll crack on with my talk. So I'm going to be talking about um, uh, age dating of a solar system um, and uh, I'll start off by saying a little bit about what exactly I'm going to be um, talking about. So this is an image um, from the Hubble Space Telescope of um, the dusty region in Orion, which is actually a stellar nursery. So this is where young stars are forming. Uh, and if you look at close up of some of these um, stars, you can see they're surrounded by these dusty um, accretionary or protoplanetary disks. Uh, which are the um, regions from which the planets will eventually form. So these are actually planetary systems in formation. Uh, my next slide is, is a, um, a high resolution image of one of these objects. This is an amazing image from the Olmo telescope in Chile. Uh, and this shows um, a young star in the center and it's surrounded, all the orange rings are all dust, dusty rings around it. So this is a disk around it from which uh, planets will eventually form. And these gaps within these rings are places where we think that um, young planets are actually starting to form and they're actually hoovering up the dust that's, that's in their orbital pathway. So it's really exciting that we can actually see this process of uh, planet formation around other stars. Um, but if we want to look at how our solar system looked when it was at the same stage. Um, we can either go back four and a half billion years and we can do that by looking at meteorites that date from that time. And in particular today, I'm gonna to be talking about carbonaceous chondrites. So I've got, uh, these are uh, some meteorites from our collection, the, difference, the six types of carbonaceous chondrites that have got matrix in them. Um, and um, these are really amazing uh, rocks because they're basically relics of the solar system when they were at this dusty disk phase. And so they can tell us about what was going on in uh, our protoplanetary disk four and a half billion years ago. And if we take a bit of a closer look up at, at um, uh, these 
meteorite. So this is uh, the Vigrana meteorite, which is also from our collection in London. And this is just to introduce the main components that I'm going to be talking about. So um, much of this meteorite, all of the little, uh, in, in this image, they look kind of brownish. All the brownish little blobs are all chondrules. So these make up most of this meteorite. Uh, then also it has um, white irregular shaped objects, which are the calcium aluminium rich inclusion. Some people say they look like bird poo on the, um, on the meteorites, but uh, uh, they just look um, all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, but usually very white. And the, the other thing that I'm going to uh, talk about very, very briefly, it only gets a mention in one slide, but I thought I should introduce it here, are amoeboid olivine aggregates. So these are, um, are usually irregular shaped objects that are rich in, in olivine, but also contain components of um, CAI type material in them. Okay, so just to go into a little bit more detail about um, the chondrules and the CAIs next. Um, so this is to introduce you to um, uh, chondrules specifically. So chondrules are usually rounded, they're usually spherical in shape. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, they're a really major component of nearly all meteorites. So um, all meteorites that, that haven't melted, apart from the very rare CI meteorites, have chondrules in them. So obviously they're something that was quite widespread in our protoplanetary disk and, and they're telling us something about some very important process in the disk. Um, they form from partly or completely melted dust ball uh, precursors and they can have quite different um, textures. So I don't know if I've got a cursor here. Yeah, this one on the left is, oop, is I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the one on the left here is a porphyritic uh, chondral, which is, uh, pr has preserved some of its um, uh, dustiness during its uh, formation event. And the one on the right uh, has got this barred texture and it got probably to higher temperatures and it got more completely melted. So they come in these different textures which tell us something about the thermal histories. Um, the main uh, minerals they're made of are uh, quite common silicates like olivine and pyroxene, also things like plagioclase and glass. And um, from looking at the, the textures and replicating these in the lab, we can see that they were high, at high temperatures for only very short amounts of time. So they probably formed by some flash heating a mechanism in the early solar system. Okay, and uh, calcium aluminum rich inclusions are, are different in several respects. So uh, instead of being made of minerals like olivine and pyroxene, they're made of minerals that are richer in calcium, and aluminium and titanium. And these are elements that, that are very refractory, that they're, they're solid to very high temperatures. Um, so they're, they are very high temperature formed objects. Uh, they have, can have different textures. So the one on the le uh, top left, is, and this was probably a condensate that, that went straight from a very hot gas to solid. Uh, giving it this, this funny um, irregular shape. So they form a little bit like a, a snowflake would. Uh, whereas the other two examples that I've shown are igneous or melted objects. They look more compact. So they're more like a hailstone rather than a snowflake. Uh, so they, they can have very, very different textures. And they also formed in uh, somewhat different environments to that, uh, oxygen, uh, gases, for example. Another way we can look at um, how they are different is using oxygen isotopes. So um, this is a plot of, um, uh, of oxygen isotopes which meteoriticists use as a fingerprint for, for saying, uh, for, for looking at links between objects or looking at if they're, if they're the same or different. Uh, and this is a plot of uh, 17O, which is the minor isotope of very minor isotope of oxygen on the vertical axis, and 18O on the horizontal axis. Um, and the dotted line across here is called the terrestrial fractionation line, where all um, uh, objects from the Earth fall. Uh, so on here, I've plotted. Well, I, it's my student's slide. I have, my, but on here, my student has plotted the sun which was measured by Kevin McKeegan and his colleagues uh, a decade ago. Um, and also the field where uh, CAIs and amoeboid olivine aggregates, AOAs, fall. You can see they're very, uh, they, they, they form in the same field uh, closest to the sun. 
Uh, and in contrast, chondrules form in a very different oxygen isotope environment, which it, uh, and these are just uh, carbonaceous chondrite chondrules, I should say, and they form in the same sort of region that the bulk meteorites, bulk carbonaceous chondrites form. So this, this diagram is just to show that there's a difference uh, between these two kinds of objects. And uh, so then the question is, what does that mean in terms of um, are the environment in which they formed, the protoplanetary disk in which, which these objects formed? Uh, and the, the answer to that is still not, not entirely clear, but uh, this is, this is a, quite an old image now from Ed Scott of the University of Hawaii, a sketch of what the early solar system might have looked like. So this shows uh, infalling interstellar dust onto the protoplanetary disk. Uh, and then um, it's likely that the CAIs may have formed closer to the sun uh, and then, but mixed outwards into the protoplanetary disk, probably by turbulent mixing outwards, but maybe in some uh, stellar winds outwards. Uh, whereas the chondrules likely formed uh, further out in the disk in the region where the asteroids themselves accreted. Uh, and there are many reasons uh, that, that we think uh, that's the case, and we can discuss it later if you want, but um, I'm just going to leave it there for now so I can crack on with the sort of main content of my talk. But the main thing I want to get across here is that these are, there are these two components, CAIs and chondrules, they probably formed in different places, um, and uh, so they're telling us about different aspects of uh, protoplanetary disk formation. Yeah, but the main focus of my talk is on um, dating. So, so age dating, that is, not the other sort of dating. Um, and and, 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 and when, you, when you're a meteoriticist, like all meteorites are really old. So it does feel a little bit like this cartoon if you're showing someone around your meteorite collection, you're trying to tell them all everything's super, super, super old. Um, but what I wanna do is go and, and quantify that a little bit. So uh, I'll start off by talking about a, a type of dating called lead lead dating, which uses the decay of uranium to uh, the uh, different isotopes of lead. I'm not going to go into this into any detail, partly because this is only done in a very few laboratories around the world can do it to sufficient precision. And our lab is, is not one of them. <laughs> Although we have tried, I can tell you about that in the discussion too, if you want. But anyway, we, we don't do this. So I'm just going to present other people's data uh, for, for this section. But this is important because this gives uh, actual absolute age dates of these objects. Uh, and what um, groups such as the uh, Copenhagen group, Connolly and Bizarro have shown is that uh, the CAIs all form in a very, very tight time frame. Um, so, so they've got it down to between four, five, six, seven, and four, five, six, eight million years. They all seem to form at about that time. They're all very, very ancient and they're the oldest, well, they're, they're among the oldest uh, silicates that, that we see on um, formed in the solar system. And uh, then the other end of this bookmark is um, CB chondrules. So these have also been measured um, by the same group in Copenhagen. And they also find that these come out at always exactly the same age, which is between four, five, six, three and four, five, six, two million years ago. And their idea is that these form during a massive impact uh, process that, that, that formed this whole group of, of meteorites. Um, and because these meteorites don't contain matrix, it could be that these represent the time in the protoplanetary disk when all of the dust had essentially dissipated um, because the matrix surrounding the, the chondrules is the material uh, that, that, uh, that encapsulates the primordial dust of the solar system of the, of the protoplanetary disk. Okay, and then uh, the Copenhagen group have also measured individual chondrules. And what they find is that these cover a range of ages, some of them as old as CAIs, uh, but then they vary in age uh, for about 5 million years, uh, almost up to the age of the impact generated CB chondrules. Uh, so the so the lead lead ages show uh, a range a range of chondral ages um, from CAI to uh, to the CB ages. And this might represent the whole age of the protoplanetary disk. Uh, but not all chronometers show the same effects as I will show you next. Okay, so most of my talk is going to be 
uh, talking about age dating using aluminium 26. So aluminium 26 is an uh, isotope that we know was present in the early solar system uh, and it decays to uh, by turning a, a proton into a neutron in its nucleus and uh, giving out heat and producing magnesium 26. And when we measure these isotopes, we have to measure them, to measure them accurately, we have to do it relative to an uh, isotope from the same element. For aluminium, that's alum we, we only have one choice, which is aluminium 27, that's the only stable isotope of aluminium. And for magnesium, uh, yeah, see there's a mistake there, it should be measured relative to magnesium 24, which is the major isotope of magnesium. So the data that I'm gonna show you, um, <coughs> all the magnesium data is relative to magnesium 24, the, the most abundant isotope of magnesium. Okay, so aluminium 26 is my favorite isotope um, for all of these reasons. And I should also say that uh, when I was asked to give this talk, there, there were several things that I could have talked about that my group are working on, um, but I, I chose to talk about this, which is maybe not the simplest thing to talk about. But the reason is, and I didn't realize this till later because it was sort of all subconscious, but um, it's because for me, aluminium 26 is my special Californian isotope. I started working on it when I was at Caltech. And uh, for me, it always means Southern California. So, so it's important to me for that reason, uh, but it's important to the rest of the world for these other reasons. So firstly, because it's radioactive, it can tell us something about the nucleosynthetic environment in which the solar system was formed. It's telling us that isotopes were formed quite quite uh, in a short time frame before the first solids in the solar system were forming. Um, secondly, we can see how well or back poorly it was mix mixed across the protoplanetary disk. It can, we can use it as a marker for mixing in general across the disk. Um, so thirdly, and most importantly for this talk, potentially it can be used as a chronometer. Um, and I will discuss that in the next few slides. And then finally, and also importantly, it was probably the most important heat source for young asteroids. It was probably the heat source that, that caused many asteroids uh, to melt and to differentiate. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about how we can use it as a chronometer. So it has a half-life of about three quarters of a million years, which is the right kind of half-life for looking at events that took place over a few million years at the beginning of the solar system. So it's really perfect for that. Uh, and the way we, we use that is that um, we look at one object, like a chondral or a CAI, that has several different minerals in it uh, that may have formed at different aluminium-magnesium ratios. So for example, olivine contains no aluminium, and magnesium, uh, uh, and say plagioclase, contains loads and loads of aluminium and very little magnesium. So if an object forms in a, if it's an igneous object, it may form different minerals with different aluminium magnesium ratios, but they'll all have the same magnesium isotope composition because they're all forming from the same reservoir. And then as time goes on, um, the aluminium 26 that's in them starts to decay and that makes the um, magnesium 26 abundance in, in the phases with the higher aluminium magnesium ratio go up. And then finally, once it's all decayed away, then it stops changing. The magnesium isotopes stop changing once everything's decayed away, which is a few million years, uh, everything would, all of the aluminium 26 would have gone. It's an extinct isotope now. Um, and so if you uh, look for these different minerals and measure their magnesium isotopes today, you will uh, hopefully get a slope. Uh, and the slope of this uh, line gives the initial aluminium 26 to 27 ratio. Uh, and then that is related to age, because if, if it formed very early on, there would have been a lot of aluminium 26 compared to 27 in, the, in these objects. Uh, and then over time it decayed away. So we can relate the aluminium 26, 27 ratio then to an age. Okay, uh, and there's another thing that happens as the aluminium decays away, uh, and that is the magnesium isotope composition of the whole solar system slightly changes. Um, and, and this is a really important point. Okay, so I know it's a Sunday afternoon, we're in a global pandemic, maybe not everybody is completely concentrating on the talk, and that's totally fine. 
But if you could just pay attention to this one point, because this is important later in my talk, and that is uh, this idea that maybe we can use magnesium isotopes themselves as a chronometer uh, by looking at how they change and evolve over time. So as the aluminum 26 decays away, new magnesium 26 is being continuously produced and the whole solar system reservoir is becoming slowly enriched in magnesium 26. It's only a very tiny effect, so you can only see it if you have a very precise way of measuring it, but it is a thing that happens. And so potentially we can, we can use just the magnesium isotopes only as a chronometer uh, because the ones that are low in magnesium 26 over 24 ratio are gonna be older. Uh, and as, uh, uh, as they get younger and younger, they're gonna be formed from a reservoir with higher magnesium 26 24 ratio. Okay, so this is just a quick recap. Um, so the things we're gonna be talking about are the uh, isochron, which gives you the slope, the initial aluminium 26, 27 ratio. And we're also gonna be talking about the initial magnesium isotope composition of, of each object, uh, which is sometimes called the uh, delta magnesium 26, zero. So this is the, the magnesium isotope composition of the reservoir from which they formed. Okay, so there are several assumptions that we need to make when we're using magnesium, uh, aluminium magnesium dating. Firstly, we have to assume an initial homogeneity of parent isotopes, aluminium isotopes. Uh, and that's something that's, that I'm gonna talk a lot more about later. Um, so initial homogeneity of the daughter isotopes as well. So especially if we're looking at how the magnesium isotope composition is evolving over time, this becomes a fairly critical point. Uh, then also if it's gonna be a good chronometer, it has to be evolved in a closed system with no post-formation or redistribution of isotopes that can sometimes mess up our, our data. Okay, so and the classic measurements of aluminium 26 uh, to uh, chronometer uh, focus on the minerals that have got a high ratio of parent to daughter. So that's a high aluminium magnesium ratio because that allows larger isotope effects to be seen. Uh, but the downside of that is that, that you're only looking at usually at the last age of crystallization when the, when the chondral was last crystallized and when these high aluminium magnesium phases first crystallized. Uh, okay, so, um, so historically, uh, there's been a very big difference in the aluminium, initial aluminium 26, 27 ratio of CAIs compared to chondrules. So on the left is an example from an Allende CAI. This was actually the discovery paper of aluminium 26 by Taiping Lee and colleagues. Uh, and on the right is just an example of a semarcona this is from the lab, uh, Kita's uh, lab in Wisconsin. So for the Allende CAI, the uh, data fall on a really nice isochrome with a slope of about 5.1 times 10 to the minus 5. So that tells you that the initial I mean 26-27 ratio was 5 times 10 to the minus 5. And for Samarcona, the isochrome is much lower. It's just under 1 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, and again, these are telling you about the aluminium 26, 27 at the time of the last crystallization. Um, and yeah, so, so I believe that Alan Rubin gave a talk last month about chondrules, and I'm afraid I missed it because it's in the middle of the night in London. But um, I would imagine that he would have uh, talked about chondrules we know can often be uh, remelted and remelted, and this can happen several times. And so, so whether it's the first crystallization or the final crystallization may actually make a difference. Okay, so, and this is a summary slide, uh, which is from Kazu uh, Nakashima's review paper in chondrules on the protoplanetary disk book. Uh, and this puts these uh, aluminium 26 data in context of, of time frame. So on the left is the initial aluminium 26, 27 ratio. Um, uh, and of these various chondrules from these various meteorite groups. And on the right-hand side scale is a time frame of what that means in terms of crystallization after CAIs. So this is assuming that CAIs were the first things to form and then everything else formed later. And you can see most chondrules uh, appear to have formed a couple of million years after CAIs and there seems to be a gap, an age gap between the CAIs and the chondrules, which we don't see in the lead lead data. Uh, and that seems to be true for all of these uh, meteorite groups as well. Uh, yeah. 
So these, these measurements were all using in situ data. So these are all looking at these very high phases, uh, high aluminum magnesium phases like plagioclase. Um, but there's another way to, to measure chondrules and that's looking at the whole chondrules. So, so looking at um, uh, the aluminum magnesium data, uh, ratio of a bulk chondral and its bulk magnesium isotope composition. And there've been a few papers that have done that uh, but they're very contradictory and I've sort of overlain them here. Right, so first of all, taking it from the top, the first paper to come out about bulk chondrules was by Bizarro et al. And they, they, they concluded that many chondrules formed around the same time as CAIs. They had very high aluminium 26, 27 ratios, but then later papers didn't show the same thing. So Van Kooten et al here have very, showed very low values Lou et al uh, showed kind of intermediate values. Uh, and then this paper, Chen et al, I was involved in, and, and honestly, it was a total nightmare to get these measurements, but uh, they showed a range of different ages. So there's a massive um, contradiction at the moment in the, in the literature values using these, these bulk chondrules, which hasn't yet been resolved. Okay, so we wanted to look at things in a slightly different way. And that is using the technique that I mentioned before, where we're looking at how the magnesium isotope composition of the solar system is evolving over time. And if we want to use that, just the magnesium isotope composition evolution over time, we need to know what the initial magnesium isotope composition of the solar system is. Um, and uh, the devil is in the detail because um, the changes are very, very small and um, and again, there's some contradiction in the literature about what the initial value is likely to be. So on the left-hand side here is um, an isochron of a uh, very high precision isochron of CAIs from Jacob Simmetal. So they gave, a, 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 as normal for CAIs, that aluminum 26, 27 ratio is around five times 10 to the minus five. And they gave an intercept that was about minus 40 plus or minus 29 ppm. Then in 2011, Lars Natal made uh, a similarly high precision, even more high precision isochron that included the CAIs and the AOAs. This is where the AOAs come into my talk, but they're only mentioned in this slide. But I'm very happy to go into the discussion about this. So if you use the AOAs and the CAIs, then you get a different intercept that's higher. It's minus 15.9 ppm. Why is that important? Okay, let me show you. Um, so you can do a calculation about how much you would expect the um, um, magnesium isotope environment of the solar system as a bulk to rise during aluminium 26 decay. Um, and if you um, assume that the whole solar system was initially full of aluminium 26 at this level uh, with an aluminium 26, 27 ratio around 5.3 times 10 to the minus five, which is the, the most precise value seen in CAIs, if you assume that's where it started, um, then uh, to reach the modern solar system value, you start off with um, an initial isotope value of minus 34. Okay, but if um, Loss and Adal are right, and that the intercept is much higher than that, it's at minus 15.9, then, the aluminum 26, 27 ratio of the bulk solar system has to be much, much lower, has to be about 2.8 times 10 to the minus five. Uh, and that's because there's, there's less um, magnesium 26 is produced. And so you can't have that much aluminum 26 over the whole solar system. So Loss and Adal suggested that because the CAI is definitely five times 10 to the minus five, that, that the bulk of the aluminum 26 is in the CAIs and the chondrules have very little. So they see uh, a massive heterogeneity in the regions where the CAIs form and the regions where the chondrules form with the CAIs forming in this really enriched region in value 26 and the chondrules forming in a very depleted region of value 26. And that makes the chronology very hard because you can have these two objects coexisting at the same time uh, with very different aluminium isotope compositions. Okay, so that's the background of the project that I realized I'm already, 
Okay. All right. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just been half now. Okay. So the, the, now I'm going to start talking about this specific project that I wanted to to present to you, and this was published in Science Advances last year. And it was led by uh, this guy who is called Tim Gregory, and he is a, was a PhD student of me and uh, Tim Elliott, who's an isotope geochemist at the University of Bristol. Uh, and the other author, or other people involved were the postdoc Tutu, ha, uh, Tutu Lu and Chris Coth, who used to be at UCLA working with Kevin. Uh, and Chris was is the genius that made uh, the instrument measure might um, be my states precisely enough for us to do this project. Um, but um, all of the credit, well, mo vast majority of credit for this has to go to Tim, who did a really good job on his PhD. He's now graduated. And I also have to thank Tim, <coughs> who has supplied all of the following slides. Okay, so our idea was then to, to look at this evolution of magnesium isotopes over time. And um, we quickly decided that olivine is the perfect mineral to do that. And that's because it has a super low, it was very abundant, and it has a super low aluminium magnesium uh, ratio. And uh, so, we, so that means that there's no, or essentially no ingrowth of aluminium uh, 26 that came to magnesium 26. So that means the magnesium isotope composition that it formed at it's the same as its modern day uh, magnesium isotope composition that we can measure. We don't need to worry about it changing. In fact, the correction that we need to make is only about 1.5 ppm and the, the, that's less than the error on our measurements. So olivine is a great mineral for us to work with. Uh, and the type of olivine that we decided to look at was uh, refractory olivine grains. So what Tim did was he used cathode luminescence to look at various carbonaceous chondrite sections uh, and look at the ones that luminesce blue in cathode luminescence. And that's because we knew that these ones are rich in calcium. They're very refractory. They may be early condensates from the beginning of the solar system. Uh, and he found these kind of um, refractory force and, and they've got low um, amounts of iron in them. So he found these refractory force rate grains in three different environments. He found them in magnesium rich chondrules and as isolated grains and also as relic grains within uh, iron-rich chondrules. We have all of these types of uh, refractory forced right grains. Um, and um, then I'm going to go through a little bit of his preparation, which I think is really incredible. So first of all, he element mapped them all. And uh, particularly, we were interested in making sure that uh, the aluminium ratio was very low. He made very careful measurements of the magnesium aluminium magnesium ratio in, in all of the grains that he was going to work on. And these are examples of, of his grains. Uh, and then another thing we did was um, we looked at the oxygen isotope composition of all of the grains. And that's because we wanted to know if they were proper chondrules or bits of chondral or whether they were actually fragments of DAIs that have got incorporated into our chondral, which would um, yeah mean a different interpretation for our data. Um, so we did the oxygen isotope compositions uh, were measured in Nancy using their iron probe. And um, they're all firmly in the uh, chondral category. So they're definitely, definitely bits of chondral. They're not bits of CAR. Okay. So here's an example of a very ugly chondral. Um, so all of the data that I'm going to show you are from one CV and one CO meteorite. Um, so, uh, Tim identified these two olivine grains and uh, they've got uh, potholes in them from when they got their iron probe measurements. He did some careful um, element mapping. And then with a laser, he outlined the um, olivine grains that he was interested in to make a pit around it. And then he, he made a bigger and bigger and bigger pit uh, until he'd removed all of the area around the, the uh, grains that he was interested in. Okay, so this is the, um, what it looked like when he was, this is the section on, that he was looking at. Uh, and then this is what it looked like once he'd removed all of the material away from his olivine grains. So basically got rid of everything he didn't want, including all of the horrible aluminium, which we didn't like for this project. And so he just had pure, um, 
magnesium rich olivine. Um, so once he'd got to this stage, uh, he would then use a laser micromill to laser out these olivine grains uh, and, and, and the, the drill kind of made them into a little tiny little powder, which he would then put in a drop of water. And, and that's a picture of him putting it in the vial. Here's a closer up picture. So this is him holding a vial, which has got a drop of water in it. And then in the drop of water is, is a little black speck. I don't know if you can see that, but that is a sample. And this whole process would take about eight hours for each olivine grain. And it didn't always work. Sometimes it completely failed or he ended up with a grain that had aluminium in it or something. Um, but um, yeah, so it was a very, very, very laborious process. Um, but he did it and he measured magnesium isotopes of the grains that he got out. And here are the data. And this was very exciting for us to see. So what we were looking for was uh, we thought that well, I thought that, that the data would all, all of the olivines would be the same thing and they'd all either show us that uh, it had a higher magnesium isotope composition or a lower magnesium isotope composition. But in fact, instead they showed a range. Um, and the most exciting data of these are the, are the grains that have the lower values, the ones that scatter around the canonical model. Uh, and that's because that's shows for sure that aluminium 26 was, was widespread in the solar system and more likely to be um, at a value of around five times 10 to minus five over the whole solar system. Uh, and that's because using the heterogeneous model where this aluminium 26 is only in the CAIs, it's uh, not in the chondrules, it's impossible to get lower values in, in the solar system. The fact that we've got a range shows that we have uh, grains that ha are showing this broad evolution from a very low value, and then they needed a lot of aluminium 26 to change the value up to the, to the value we see today. So this is really strong um, evidence for this canonical model of widespread aluminium 26. Okay, and then uh, we also try to, to, use, uh, to use our system as, as age dating. So assuming that everything started at this low level of the canonical, um, using the canonical model that it all started at minus 34 ppm delta 26 magnesium. Uh, and then we assumed that the reservoir of uh, the solar system was increasing magnesium 26 over time. Uh, and so by mapping our values onto this evolution curve, we can then read off values of the age of these um, refractory four strike grains. Okay, and this is the range of ages that we see. So we see a lot of these grains formed at the same time as CAIs at time t equals zero, but then they show a range of uh, up to around 2 million years or so. But they show a range of ages. And, and if I compare that uh, to the data that we uh, looked at before for the in situ aluminum 26 ages, you can see they're a little bit different in that um, uh, although the CAI show old ages, none of the chondrules do. Uh, and so we think this might be something to do with reprocessing in the place where the chondrules form. So we know, we know that these refractory chondrules have uh, oxygen isotope values that put them in the forming place, but they were there millions of years before the final um, melting events that affected chondrules. So this shows that chondrules were reprocessed for several million of years. So the refractory Forsterites were the first objects to form in the chondral forming region. And then these in situ dates give you the final um, melting events in this region. And then we can also compare this to uh, our lead lead ages that we showed before, uh, which also show a span of ages. So, so these are kind of sort of comparable. There's the um, lead lead ages span to, to younger ages than the refractory forced rights, um, but this might uh, reflect some sort of processing. So, so from what uh, we're seeing, we think that our data are, are actually compatible with these lead, lead ages and all of them show ongoing chondral formation over several millions of years. Okay, I'm actually coming towards the end of my talk now. 
Um, so what we've shown is that aluminium 26, 27 was largely homogeneous across the protoplanetary disk at a level of around 5.3 times 10 to minus five. So using our technique, we can't kind of, we can't make it, we can't make it really precise, but, but it's, a, it's a, a compatible with that level. And that implies that there was actually widespread mixing of aluminium 26 across the whole protoplanetary disk. Um, and so we think that chondrules and CAI started to form at about the same time, about four, five, six, seven million years, at least refractory four strike grains were forming then. And uh, there was a really ongoing process of chondral formation. So it happened over several millions of years. Uh, and that means that the protoplanetary disk itself was also present for several millions of years. Uh, and so dust was, was present and was, there were thermal events going on throughout the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk. Uh, and yeah, that's all I've got for you. But thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Sarah. That was a thank wonderful you. talk. Um, so we will um, open up the floor for questions and um, just unmute yourself and and go ahead and um, identify who you are, if you would, because, for example, I can only see about nine or 10 boxes on my screen um, right now. Yes, and um, otherwise, another alternative would be to go ahead and type your question into the chat box and uh, I can ask it uh, or, um, or Sarah can just read the chat box, I suppose. Um, so um, we did have one question uh, during uh, an early part of your talk, Sarah, and I think it's mostly been answered, but I'll just allow you to expand on this a little bit if you like. Um, and this comes from Mimi. It's, um, she was wondering how long does it take for a solar system to fully form? Yeah, so yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great question. So, um, so what, so we think, yeah, it depends what you call by a solar system really, but, but I can talk about, talk about the protoplanetary disk existence. And uh, so the, CAI seems to be the first solids that were forming in the disk. And then the process seems to take several millions of years. And um, yeah, so I like to think it's bookended by the um, formation of the CB chondrites, uh, which happen, seem to happen in an environment where there was no remaining dust. So by that, by about 5 million years, the dust had all disappeared. And I think that lifetime of about 5 million years is compatible with what we understand of other uh, star uh, systems as well. So, so it seems to be about a plausible length of time for it to have formed. I have a question, is Alan. Um, do you, is there any suggestion that the refractory forsterites that formed more recently have slightly more FEO? No. Yeah, so we, we did kind of look at that uh, Alan, and that's a really good question. So honestly, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to work out because we couldn't predict what what um, grain had what composition. And um, yeah, so Tim plotted everything, looked at the FEO content, looked at, yeah, we couldn't see any relationship with oxygen isotopes. Um, yeah, we couldn't see any relationship with chemistry. So yeah, I don't know. And those that are younger, they're to be found sort of randomly among as relic grains, as isolated grains, uh, yeah. there's no correlation there as well? There's no correlation there as well. And, uh, yeah, but one thing about the iron is that um, we weren't particularly careful about using really um, pristine meteorites. So, so we used Felix, which is a type 3.2 or 3.3 um, and an NWACV. And um, yeah, so I think the iron was all redistributed <coughs> during parent body alteration. I so maybe that's what we, that we got up to 80 participants, Sarah. So you're a big wow. Other questions? Well, James is asking a question in the chat room, which we, you know, when I see this one, normally this is when we say it's time to end the meeting, but we won't. <laughs> And okay. the reason is because the question is, how did chondrules form? Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> Let me refer that to my honorable colleague, Alan Rubin. 
let, let me just say that uh, this has been contentious for more than 200 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't answer that question right, right now. There's many, many different models. They may have formed in different ways. Uh, as, as there's more than one way to skin a cat, I've been told there may be more than one way to form conjure. Yeah, I think we have to move towards a kind of model where there's lots of different ways of forming chondrules. So I know that seems like a bit of a get out cause, but everyone's got their own favorite model. But some my, my talk on chondrule formation is recorded uh, for the December. So anybody's interested in it, they could actually go to the archives and watch my talk. It's on our YouTube channel, which I can link on, okay. in the chat box. Yeah, now. I'd like to see that. Great. So Tom Burbine wants to know, he said, great talk. Could you use this technique on olivine and achondrites or stony irons, for example, palisic olivine? Yeah, sure. I'd really, uh, yeah, great, great idea. I'd love to. I mean, I would imagine that would be um, much closer to the modern um, value for magnesium isotopes. So, uh, but yeah, I guess some irons are really old, aren't they? So yeah, that, that's a really good idea to do that. If you were ever to do that, Sarah, it'd be interesting to look at the Eagle Station palisites as well as the main group. Yeah, great idea. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have forgotten by tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, another question comes in. Other than shape, is there any other way to distinguish between chondrules versus CAIs when you look at them? No. Uh, well, well, they're white, they're white, but uh, yeah, I, I went to, white, right. you know, I, so Martin Bizarro tells this really, he, he tells the story much in a much more funny way than me, but um, so Martin Bizarro is from Copenhagen. He was one of the, yeah, he did a lot of work on aluminum magnesium isotopes and he was criticized a lot because he's really an isotoper and not a petrologist. And um, so he invited the great Sasha Croat from Hawaii to Copenhagen to spend some time there to teach him how to recognize chondrules from CAIs in hand specimen. So he got like Sasha to come across the world, like, you know, he's treated like a king. And then Martin sat him down and say, so tell me, how do you tell the difference between chondrules and CAIs in hand specimen? And Sasha said, no, oh, you can't really. You have to, <laughs> have to get a section made. <laughs> But once you get a section made and look at them in the SEM, it's quite quite easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the yeah. SEM, it's very right. easy. Right. It is hard in hand specimen because especially if they're very um, magnesium poor um, chondrules, then they can look quite white and quite pale. So it can be quite hard and hard to tell the difference between AOAs and CAIs as well in hand specimen. So there's another question that comes in from Donald Hurd. If you're using CL to identify your refractory olivine, aren't you dismissing any with higher iron content as they would not luminesce? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, so yeah, I mean, this is very much kind of pilot study, I would say. And, and so we just wanted to get in there with some samples that we could be relatively confident we're gonna be old, really, well, as old as we could make it. So. So that's why we went for CL, but there's a lot more to do. And uh, yeah, there's no reason to, to dismiss things with iron in them. Any other questions? <coughs> it's, getting, it's getting late for Sarah. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I had a coffee before I started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, so Will this talk be available to watch online? Um, Juliet shaking her head yes. Sarah, yes. is that okay with you? But yeah, yeah, sure. Because all the data have been published, Fine. right? All the data have been published, yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, okay, well, thank you so much. I have one question. Oh, uh, what, what, do we know, what do we know about, uh, from theoretical models, how long it would take for the solar system to form? How does that compare with the, this like 5 million uh, year estimate um, that's provided right here, or at least 4 million years? Yeah, I, th yeah. I, th I think there's, um, there's not really a problem theoretically with that sort of time frame. I think there is an issue with um, storage so it's quite hard to to make say a refractory olivine 
uh, grain very early on and then have it still hanging around for chondral formation several million years later. So, so that is a problem that uh, it's been grappled with because there's, there's a, you know, we've known for a long time that there's a potential CAI storage problem that CAIs are formed really early and then they have to hang around for several million years before the accretion of the chondrites. Um, so yeah, having, having small objects floating around for a long time is very hard, but, and you have to, you know, there are several people who have tried to, to, to work out how you can do that. So, so quite a lot of sample, then uh, that might be a possible way of keeping these objects around for enough time. I don't know if colleagues have anything to add to that. Well, there's a little bit more. Some of them are very fragile in texture. People bring them and the bodies break up, but that wouldn't be consistent with some of the fragile textures that some of the CAIs have. So that's yeah. that, that's a problem that all of us are aware of and solve to everyone to anyone's satisfaction. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's quite. It is an interesting problem. And yeah, you're right. You, yeah. There's, there's an idea of having a, a real CAI body, but also that would be kind of super hot from all of the aluminum 2016. Yes, days, yes. And yeah, it wouldn't really work. Well, Kevin, I think we ought to let her go to bed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. It was a wonderful talk. It's really great to see you. I, I look forward to when we can see you in person. I'm speaking yes. for. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, a round of applause. I don't know how this will come across. <laughs> All that stuff.